In this presentation, we will discuss a periodic inventory system. As we discuss the periodic inventory system, we want to keep in mind and contrast the perpetual inventory system. That's the inventory system we will most likely be seeing and using when discussing inventory. But the periodic system is actually used more often when we have a less sophisticated system. So if we're working in a situation where we don't have a sophisticated system, we would more likely be using a periodic system in order to simplify that system. If we have a more complex system or a system that has a better ability to pick up the information as we record it, such as an electronic system, a scanner, that knows the cost of items as we go, then we would want to use a perpetual inventory system, which would be preferred. And it's just a trade-off between the added uh, cost of a system like that and the time that it would take for a perpetual system versus the ease, but less information we have during the process on a periodic type of system. As we go through this, we're gonna look through some transactions, some purchases, and some sales on a periodic method. We're going to have our journal entry. It's going to be recorded on the left side. This will be our chart of accounts on the right side. The journal entry will have both debit and credit columns as well as credits in brackets. The chart of the accounts will only have on the trial balance the debits and credits being represented by debits not having brackets or positive numbers, credits having brackets or negative numbers, and then this zero will show that the debits minus the credits equals zero, meaning debits equal the credits. Then we'll post this information and see what we end up with so that we can see this activity in a nice little worksheet, see which accounts are affected, which type of accounts, assets, liability, equity, income, and expense accounts are affected, and the effect on net income, starting with purchase merchandise on account. This is going to be a transaction that will not differ under either method. If we have a perpetual or periodic system, we're going to purchase the merchandise, same transaction. We're going to say, is cash affected? No, because we purchased it in this case on account. That means we purchased it with accounts payable, but I would first think about what we got. We got merchandise inventory. Inventory is an asset, has a debit balance. We need to make it go up. We're going to do, therefore, the same thing to it, another debit. So here's the debit to merchandise inventory. We're going to credit something now, and now we can say, okay, it's accounts payable, and we already know that we're going to credit it having done the merchandise inventory first. Then, uh, so we're going to say we're going to credit the accounts payable. That makes sense because accounts payable has a credit balance indicated by the brackets here. The bad thing is going up. We owe more money because we purchased something on an account. Therefore, we do the same thing to it, another credit. If we post this out then, we have the merchandise inventory here, which we will post here. We have the $10,000 debit balance. It's going to increase by another debit of $13,000 to a total of $23,000. Then we have the accounts payable, $6,500 credit. We're going to do the same thing to it. This credit is going to be posted $13,000 plus the $6,500 gives us the amount owed in accounts payable, $19,500. The effect on the accounting equation, assets are going up, inventory is going up, the liabilities are going up because the uh, accounts payable is going up, and the equity remains the same. If we see all the accounts here, we can see the transaction here. We can see that there is, we're still in balance and no effect on net income. We purchased inventory, we didn't expense the inventory because we have not yet used it. We will expense it at the point it is used, at the point of sale in the form of cost of goods sold. So note one more time, this journal entry is the same under either method, perpetual or periodic. Next transaction, sale for 3,120 cost 2,400. This will be a transaction that will differ under the periodic and perpetual system. The uh, perpetual system, what we're not doing here, would record both the sales portion and the cost portion. Under a periodic system, what we are doing here, we will record just the sales portion, recording the cost at the end, at the late, at the end of the time period, month, week, year, whatever uh, we're doing here. Uh, and uh, we're gonna do that by doing a physical count. So if a problem gives you the cost at the point in time that we are working a periodic system, it doesn't matter, we don't need the cost. And in practice, the fact that we may not know the cost is part of the problem, meaning 
if we are uh, trying to have someone run our store basically and we just want a, a clerk up there to be recording transactions, collecting cash, giving back change, and we don't have a sophisticated uh, electronic system, then they know the sticker price, of course, when someone pays them, they know how much money they got. Uh, what they do not know, because it's not on the sticker price, is the cost. So we don't want the, our clerk to have to figure out the cost in order to record the cost every single time someone comes up. That would take a more experienced clerk, someone that was able to do that. What we want them to do, and if we were doing it too, we want to be as, as easy as possible. We want to focus on sales. Therefore, we're just going to record the sales portion. That's easy. We're focused on giving back the change relating to the, to the customer. And then we'll figure out the cost at the end. Now, if we had a very sophisticated, if we had a nice system that was a scanner system that knew the cost at that point, and I wouldn't even need to know it or think about it, then uh, we can use that system and it would be just an automatic type of system. So if we don't have that, we're often using this periodic system. And the journal entry would be the same as if we were a service company. We would say, we're going to assume we got uh, the not cash and we made it on account. So on account, we've got the accounts receivable uh, is going up. It has a debit balance. We're going to make it go up by doing the same thing to it, another debit. And then the other side would be some kind of revenue account. So we're talking sales in this case. Here's the sales account. Uh, it could be revenue. It could be income. If it was a service company, it'd be fees earned. It's just another name for the same thing, a revenue account. Revenue accounts have credit balances. It will be going up. So we're going to do the same thing to it, another credit. So then if we post this, then we're posting this uh, accounts receivable here. So there's a debit and a debit, 6,000 plus the debit of 3,120 brings us up to 9,120. Then we're going to post this sales credit to the sales item here. So we have zero going up by 3,120 in the credit direction to 3,120. Effect on the accounting equation is the assets are increasing by the accounts receivable, the liabilities are not affected, and the equity is going up because sales is going up. Sales is increasing the net income calculation of revenue minus expenses, and uh, net income is part of equity. When net income increases, total equity increases. If we look at all of the transactions, all the balances here, we can see that we are in balance. We can see this effect on net income here. That's from this account here. So this part down, that's the income statement. So it went up in the credit direction. This isn't a loss. This is income representing a credit of 3,120. And of course, the assets of accounts receivable too went up. Next transaction, we're going to have another purchase. Purchase merchandise on account for 6,000. Uh, or just to mention here, uh, obviously, if, if this was a perpetual system, we would have the other side of this too, being cost of goods sold and merchandise inventory. That's what we're leaving out in a periodic system. That's what we do at the end of the time period. That's what we'll get done through a physical count. Now we're going to go back to another purchase. We purchase merchandise on account. Remember that the purchases will be the same under the two methods. It is what it is. We're going to pay what we pay. We got what we got uh, under the purchase item. So we're going to purchase on account meaning we're not going to pay cash. We are instead going to be paying with accounts payable. But first, to think about the debits and credits, which might be more easy, to think about what we got. What we got, merchandise inventory, which is an asset. We got more of it, therefore goes up. How do we make something go up? We do the same thing to it, another debit in this case. So we're going to debit merchandise inventory. Then we know we're going to credit something for 6000 because we have a debit there. And we know that that then is going to be accounts payable. So by thinking about merchandise inventory first, it might help us to know that the credit is going to be going to accounts payable. And the reason I think that's a benefit is because we deal with cash a lot. So we probably have more experience uh, increasing and decreasing asset accounts than possibly liability accounts, which we uh, don't work with quite as often. So if we do that, then uh, we have, if we double check that, we'll say this is a credit balance in accounts payable. We need to make it go up. The bad thing's going up because we bought something and didn't pay for it, therefore owe on it. So we do the same thing to it, which in this case is another credit. Posting this out then, we've got the merchandise inventory at 6,000 debit. We're going to post that here to the merchandise inventory account. 
We have 23,000 starting. We do the same thing to it. Another debit, bringing the merchandise inventory to a balance of 29,000. Then the accounts payable, we're going to post this to accounts payable. 19,500 credit represented by the brackets. We're posting this. We're just bringing this over and posting the 6,000 there, bringing the balance up to 25,500. Accounting equation, we see that the assets are going up as merchandise is going up. The liabilities are going up because we owe more money in accounts payable. Equity, not affected. If we see all the accounts, then we see that we are in balance by the green zeros, debits equaling the credits, and we see that there's no effect on net income. No effect on net income, which are going to be these accounts. We did buy inventory. We have not yet used it, therefore put it on the books as an asset, not as an expense. It will be expense when when we sell it in the form of cost of goods sold, the form of expense. Next transaction, another sale. So we're gonna have a sale on account. This will be the transaction that differs when uh, we're going from a perpetual to a periodic system. How does it differ? Well, it'll be the same on the sales half of it and we will be eliminating the cost half of this transaction in a periodic system, picking it up at the end of the process when we do a physical count as opposed to a perpetual system where we would record this as we go. So note what we're doing here on a periodic system. We're only going to be recording pretty much the same thing we would if we were not a merchandising company, if we were just a service company with no inventory, meaning we're going to record the sale. Uh, and so if we did work and, and we got money, uh, we didn't get money yet, but we got accounts receivable. The accounts receivable is going up. It's a debit balance account, so we're going to do the same thing to it, which is another debit. So there's the debit to accounts receivable. The other side then would be some type of sales account. And if it was a service company, fees earned possibly, possibly just an account called income or revenue. When it's a merchandising company, all we do is change the name to sales. Typically, that's a normal name that often we will see in a merchandising company. Has a credit balance. We're going to do the same thing to it, which in this case is another credit. So here's our journal entry. It's a, it's a more simplified method. That's all we need to do. What we are eliminating in the periodic method that we would be including if it were a perpetual method is the inventory going down and the cost of goods sold going up, bringing net income down. We will do that at the end when we do a physical count of the inventory. Posting this out, we're going to say the receivable has a debit here. We're going to uh, increase it here. So the debit of 9,120 in accounts receivable goes up by this 2,340 to a balance of 11,460. The sales is, has a credit here, 2,340. We're going to increase this sales here, 3,120, by that credit of 2,340 to a balance of 5,460. Accounting equation, the um, assets are going up because uh, receivables went up, the liabilities remain the same, and the equity is going up because sales went up, revenue went up, bringing the net income calculation of revenue minus expenses up. Net income will affect the total equity in the same way that it is affected, meaning if net income goes up, total equity goes up. Here's the full transaction with all the other accounts. We can see we are in balance by the green zeros. We can see that net income is increasing. That's this part of the uh, calculation here. The sales are increasing. Net income, that's not a loss. That's revenue, revenue going up. And of course, the assets are going up with the accounts receivable. Then we're going to see the ending inventory. So we're saying we're at the end of the time period now. We're at the end of the time period and we're trying to figure out, okay, so it's the end of the month and we have uh, accounts receivable and sales, but the periodic system is not very accurate until the end of the period when we do the physical count. Because until that time, it looks like revenue is way higher than it is because we are missing our most important, our largest cost, that being the cost of us using the inventory in order to generate that, the cost of us giving the inventory away in order to generate revenue, that cost called cost of goods sold. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a physical count in order to figure out uh, you know, how much inventory is left. Now we're going to uh, not go through the process. We're just going to say there's $24,800 worth of inventory in other words. Now in real life, of course, we would have to count the inventory in units and then convert it to dollars. That conversion can be a little bit more tricky 
than we would think at first and therefore we're going to go into that process later and use some different methods including LIFO, FIFO, average or specific identification uh, at, a, at a later time. But now, for now, we need to just know on a periodic system, we're going to count it. Now also note that if it was a very simplified system and all the, all the stuff is the same, the units are worth the same or cost the same, then it's not a problem, it's an easy calculation, it's an easy conversion. But when we purchase things and the price changes over time, converting from the units to the dollar amount can be a little bit more tricky. So in any case, we're going to say that we counted it and we have $24,800 worth of inventory left. We're going to use that fact in order to uh, adjust our ending inventory to the correct amount because note what we did not do through the time period. We never reduced the inventory even though we were selling it, meaning we recorded the beginning balance plus purchases but had not decreased it as we sold the items. And so that's what we need to account for in our periodic system now. So we're going to do the cost of goods sold calculation, very important calculation, whether it be using the uh, perpetual or periodic system. And here it is, cost of goods sold. We have the beginning inventory, 10,000. You can see that on the first trial balance that we started with here. And in real life, you can go to, if we were working with this, we would want to go to the general ledger and see that beginning balance, what we started with in the inventory accounts, $10,000. We're increasing that by purchases. These are the two purchases we made during this time period, 19,000. Again, if we were looking at the uh, general ledger, we would be able to see the increases. What we would not be seeing throughout this time period are any decreases to the merchandise. So that's gonna give us our 29,000, which is basically that matches what we have on our books right now. And what we haven't done is of course record the decrease. Now, we don't know exactly what the decrease was, what we do know is we counted our inventory and we have 24,800 left. This number represents what we could have sold during the time period in dollar amount, meaning uh, we didn't have this at any given time, but throughout the month, we uh, had uh, $29,000 worth of different inventory going in and out throughout that time period, meaning throughout the month, we could have sold a maximum of $29,000 worth of inventory could not sell more because we didn't have more than that. That's the max that we could have sold. And then if we compare that then to our ending inventory, which we got through a physical count, the 29,000 minus the 24,800 ending inventory gives us the cost of the goods that we sold, 4,200. So this is what we're missing here. We're missing this 4,200 and we're missing the fact that this uh, merchandise inventory went down by 4,200. So this merchandise inventory needs to match this. This cost of goods sold needs to match that. And we're gonna do that with a journal entry. So here's our calculation. Once again, we're gonna, we're gonna make the journal entry. Note, I've, I've added some units here just so you can see that uh, we, we could do this calculation with units as well. So if it told us that, uh, I mean, if we counted that we had uh, ending inventory of 2,480 units, that's how much we counted and we said that they, the unit cost was $10, then we can multiply this out and we can figure out that it would be 24,800 in terms of dollars. So if we have a nice even unit cost, that conversion is not too difficult. It would look something like this. Note this cost of goods sold calculation can be done in terms of units here, as well as in terms of dollars. And you wanna be sure just like with any measurement method, that we know which method we're using and not mixing up units to dollars. And, uh, and so then you can convert it through this conversion. So if we record this then, we got the 4,200. We're gonna increase cost of goods sold by that. So here's the cost of goods sold and we're gonna increase the merchandise inventory. Here's the merchandise inventory. If we post this out then, we're gonna say merchandise inventory uh, is here. It's gonna go down. And it might be easier to this to list out merchandise inventory first, even though it's on the bottom, because it's often easier for us to, to visualize what merchandise inventory is than cost of goods sold. Merchandise inventory, we can think of as an asset, a physical thing that we're actually gave away during the sales process. Therefore, it must go down and it has a debit balance. So we needed to credit it. So we're gonna credit it. So the merchandise inventory had 29,000. We're making it go down by 4,200 the amount of the cost of goods sold we calculated, or the difference, in other words, 
between what we had on the books, the amount available for sale, and what we counted the ending in the inventory to be, given us that 24,800, what we counted the ending inventory to be. And then the other side of it, this cost of goods sold is gonna be calculated here, starting at zero, going up by 4,200 in the debit direction, bringing us to an ending balance of 4,200. If we take a look at the full transaction, we can see that we are back in balance. We can see that the total assets are decreasing because we decreased the merchandise inventory for the amount that we sold. We can see that the cost of goods sold is going up. That's going to decrease net income. Net income started here. That's not a loss. That's the revenue here minus the expenses and the contra accounts. These two are actually contra accounts and, and cost of goods sold is the expense. And then what we did is we had the 4,200 cost of goods sold, which we put in place, which is the cost of goods sold, not just for this day, of course, but the cost of goods sold for the entire period, the tire, the, whatever we're doing this over a day, a month, a week, uh, probably, probably not a year, day, month, or week, we have the 4,200. So our ending result then, we had uh, 5,460 over this time period, but now we're recording the fact that we had to expend not in terms of dollars at the point of time of sale, but in terms of merchandise, $4,200 worth of merchandise. The difference now being $5,460 minus the $4,200 giving us the $1,260. Note that the perpetual system and the periodic system will end up result in the same location. So we should be at the same point at the end of the time period. The perpetual system, however, has the benefit of, of tracking it as we go so it should be basically correct throughout the system and it also gives us kind of that double check that it should already uh, have this number at the end of the time period and then we can double check it through the cost of goods sold which is a better method to check if we had anything like theft or spoilage or shrinkage something other than a selling inventory that made uh, the ending inventory go down note under this method what we're doing is we're just figuring out what the ending inventory should be and we're assuming that this difference was all due to sales that happened. But it is quite possible that the ending inventory went down for some reason other than sales. And that could have been theft or spoilage or lost or breakage or something like that. And uh, the perpetual system makes it easier for us to track that.